I think we are live. Welcome back. If you are uh, joining us, um, if you're joining us for the first time, what we're doing is we are reading through Mark together as a youth group. Um, we are in chapter two tonight. Um, I hope that some of you guys are reading along. If you have fallen behind already, that's okay. Go ahead and try to catch up. It's only a few pages. By the way, we chose Mark because Mark is one of the short is the shortest gospel, um, and so um, who knows? Maybe we'll be able to uh, go even farther along um, and do different books as we continue this reading challenge. If the quarantine gets extended, but we figured this short book would be perfect for um, for uh, the short quarantine we've got. I know it doesn't feel short, but you know, three weeks is better than three months, and we probably shouldn't speak too soon. Um, anyone watching? If you're out there, go ahead and leave a comment to let me know you're in the video. I can see your comments as they come up. I see a thumbs up, but I'm not sure who it's from. Um, uh, I guess we should start this video first by looking at some of the comments I was left yesterday um, about the different apocalyptic teams people would be bringing. Um, I noticed that Aiden responded, and uh, Aiden, um, I, I think you're going to die. Um, just looking at your apocalypse team here, I'm pretty confident uh, that you're going to die. Um, oh, hey, Emily. Hey, Andres. It's great to see you. Um, I see that you're on now. I can, your comments come up. I'm probably on a little bit of a delay, but I'll see them eventually. Um, so, uh, but in, anyway, Aiden, I think you're going to die. I mean, Eric is a great cook, let's be honest, but I mean, you're assuming that you're going to have like a full kitchen and Eric's pretty particular about the way he cooks his food. And so, I don't know, if he doesn't have the right ingredients, he's a pretty picky eater. So, I don't know, he might just bring the mood of the place down um, when all you have left to eat is hot dogs and he refuses to eat. Uh, although, you know, that could mean more food for you. I don't know. Obviously, the same thing is true with Key and I. That's a good pick. I picked him because, um, obviously, he's... Uh, He's going to eat last. Um, Brayton bring, te bring technological help. I mean, sure, but I mean, this is the apocalypse. Do you expect there to be a lot of technology out there? Um, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. But I'm not feeling good about that pick. He is your brother, though, so I understand you got to pick him. Um, Savannah, yeah, of course you want nice people in the apocalypse, but is Savannah going to, like, uh, help you, like, fend off the scavengers? I don't think so, but, you know. And then Andres, uh, I think I assume you're talking about Andres Hernandez, who has been camping all over Colombia. Um, so that's true. But okay, that's a good pick. I'll give you that. Andres is a good pick, but he's not a part of our youth group. Um, he's not a part of our youth group, so I don't know if he's a how good of a pick that is. Um, he used to be. Maybe he'll come back one day. Andres, if you're watching, please come back. Um, hey Emily, it is okay that you're not in youth group anymore. You are more than welcome to come watch these videos and participate in the discussion. We are so glad to have you. Um, uh, let's see, what other teams we have? Andres, I know you're on the call. Um, you picked a team of middle schoolers, um, with me and Juan. Um, it's good to pick me. Obviously, I'm the best choice. Um, Juan, uh, he's, a I mean, he's not as good of a youth leader as I am, but, you know, he's pretty cool, I guess. Um, and then the other three are pretty solid picks. Judah, I noticed on these comments, offered himself as food, which is disgusting, but maybe necessary one day. Olsen, um, you know, he'd always be good to have on the team. Uh, Daniel obviously could help us navigate um, Columbia a little bit better than the rest of you. Uh, maybe Juan would be pretty good, although he lived a long time somewhere else. I don't know, a pretty good team. Definitely better than Aiden's team, that's for sure. Um, just commenting on other comments, I see that one of the Ancisos left a comment. I don't know if that's Matilde or Maya, but I assume it's not Jorge or Jenny because I doubt... It says they're missing youth group a lot. Maybe they're just missing the time away from their daughters. I don't know. But I'm assuming this is one of their daughters writing to say that they've uh, missed youth group. Um, so I'm going to guess Matilde, but you can let me know in the comments on this video. Um, 
yeah, so that's the last video. Um, I did get one question that I wanted to answer um, from one of you. You didn't post it on the video, but that's okay. Um, one of you who didn't want to post their public comment, their comment publicly, asked me why did Jesus have to be baptized? In Mark chapter one, it starts with the story of Jesus going to John the Baptist to be baptized in the Jordan River, and um, this person asked me why. I mean, I thought baptism was for sinners. I thought baptism was for people who want to follow Jesus. Why would Jesus himself get baptized? And that's funny because that's also the question that John the Baptist asks Jesus when this same story is told in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so, John, Jesus comes to John and John says, What are you doing? I don't need to be baptizing you. You need to be baptizing me. Um, there's a lot of different theologians that have talked about this issue. Why would Jesus go and be baptized? And there's a couple different answers out there. Um, but I think one of the ones that most, of, most, most commentators agree on, and the one that I'm uh, most in agreement with, I think, is that uh, Jesus was going to John with all these other people who are seeking repentance in order to identify with those people. To say, hey, I am coming in and I'm in this with you. I'm going to identify with your sin. I'm actually going to take your sin on myself. And so I'm going to unite myself to the cause of sinners by going through the same thing they did, to go through this baptism, basically to symbolize what's eventually going to happen, that on the cross I'm going to bear their sins on myself. Um, so, the person who asked me that question, that was actually their, uh, their, their guess, which was a good guess. Um, it also serves as, a, as a, a time for Jesus to start off his ministry, and he starts off his ministry saying, this is what I'm all about, and that's what John's baptism was about, was re repentance for forgiveness of sins, and that's what Jesus' baptism was all about. So, um, good questions. Please keep the questions coming in. I'd love to answer um, any that you have, if I have the answers. And sometimes things are confusing and I just don't uh, know for sure what, uh, what it means. Um, but I do think the main important meaning of the passage is usually clear. Um, hey, Valentina. Welcome. I know you're back in Columbia. I know it's not a very fun time to be in Columbia, but I'm glad you're on this call with us. Um, all right, let's get to, briefly to my thoughts on this passage. We're going to try to keep this short. So what stood out to me? Um, a couple things stood out to me. I'll, I'll list a couple of them. Um, one of them uh, is kind of similar to the first chapter. I thought it was interesting that Jesus comes to Levi, the tax collector, um, who's also known as Matthew, the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and he comes to him while he's at work collecting taxes. And he says, follow me, and the guy just gets up and goes. Um, makes me think that maybe he hated his job, but probably more likely Jesus had a commanding presence. Um, and that's really cool, um, and that people are going to want to follow him. When they get to know him, when they see him, when they experience him, something radically changes. Which is very different than what happens when the Pharisees um, and the tax collectors in the first chapter um, see this man get healed. They don't want to follow Jesus. In fact, they're angry at Jesus. Um, so, you know, when you encounter Jesus, it creates a reaction one way or the other. If you really accept what he's saying, it makes you either want to run the other way or it makes you want to come follow him and leave everything behind. Um, so, yeah. That's what stood out to me. Um, three things Mark is teaching us. Uh... This chapter, I like to call, Jesus makes the Pharisees angry. Um, it's kind of like he is going through and trying to push all the buttons that the, uh, that the Pharisees have. Um, and uh, you see that here in a few different ways. First, you see it with the paralyzed man. He's confronting um, their understanding of who Jesus is, right? Because what does he say? He says, I want to forgive this guy's sins. And they're like, who can forgive sins? And Jesus is like, well, if you want to know if I can forgive sins, watch what else I can do. Um, and he heals the guy, saying to them, hey, I'm not just some teacher. I have the power to forgive sins. Um, 
Second thing he does is he, uh, it says that he eats with these sinners and tax collectors, um, which is really surprising to the Pharisees because they wouldn't be called dead eating with the kinds of people that Jesus is eating with, which I think is awesome. Um, hey, Gabby, uh, we are on question uh, number two. I'm talking about the three things that Mark is teaching us. Um, I'm on a little bit of a delay, so it'll take a minute before what I say catches up with you. Um, but, uh, you see, he talks about, um, he, he tells that he told all these people that Pharisees would never eat with. And then he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And what Mark is teaching us about Jesus there is that Jesus confronts self-righteousness. Um, he doesn't want the, he doesn't approve of the Pharisees feeling like they've got everything together. He wants them to realize that they are just as in need of Jesus as these sinners and tax collectors. Um, cool. Another thing he challenges here is fasting. This is also challenging the Pharisees because uh, the Pharisees are fasting and they're all religious and they're not eating to show how religious they are. And Jesus and his disciples, they're, they keep eating. And, um, and Jesus... Uh, gets challenged by the Pharisees here, and he's like, why would they fast? Fasting, the whole point of fasting is to point to your need of the Lord. And I am the Lord, and you have me, so there's no reason to fast. Um, so Jesus is saying that he is what religion is all about. All these religious practices like fasting um, are supposed to point to Jesus. Um, and so what he's, he, he reveals that the, that the Pharisees have got religion, but they have missed out on their need for Jesus. That's kind of what the story, or that's exactly what the story of the wineskins he tells about is. He's saying you can't put a new, uh, a new patch on an old wineskin. What's he saying? He's saying the, the Pharisees are trying to take this good practice of fasting and put it on their old broken down hearts but they, they haven't been renewed, so their fasting has no power because they don't actually have the ability to see Jesus, to experience the new wine. The new wine just busts out. It doesn't stay. Um, they need to be fully made new before fasting will gain any meaning because fasting is supposed to point the person who longs for Jesus um, to remember that Jesus is all they need and Jesus is the source of joy. Um, and so they're missing out on that. And then finally, you see the, him challenging the Sabbath. Um, this is just the same kind of thing as the fasting. The, the Pharisees have these rules about the Sabbath, and they actually added extra rules on top of what God had added, like you can't even pick grain on the Sabbath. Um, and Jesus is like, hey, the Sabbath was meant to remind you of resting and trusting in me, and you're missing out on that. Um, these disciples are with me. They've got it. Um, and... You guys are just doing religion just to do religion. So, uh, those are the three things that stood out to me. Um, obviously, that's not super well prepared. It's kind of going off the fly with what I was thinking about. Um, what's beautiful to me? I just, as someone who likes to challenge stupid rules, um, Jesus, I just love that Jesus is willing to challenge um, uh, kind of rules for the sake of rules. But Jesus does give rules, and Jesus gives rules that are actually for people's good, and they do make sense. They're not just um, for the sake of rules, and that, that's really important to the rebellious uh, person inside of me. Um, but I think God, I don't think it's true rebellion. I think it's a true longing for what's right and what's good um, when it's done rightly. Obviously, my heart's twisted, and there's many times that my rebellion is against the wrong things. Um, what's confusing? Uh, when I first read this, the whole parable of the wineskins was confusing to me. Um, uh, the, I'm not sure exactly why he uses the story about David eating the bread in the holy place. Um, I didn't have time to go back and look at that story. That's, that story is probably in 1 Samuel, would be my guess. Um, I need to look it up. And maybe if I read that story, I'd understand a little bit more about what Jesus is talking about there. Um, but those are two things that I didn't fully understand uh, when I first read it. Um, it. Took me a little bit to think about it. Uh, what is encouraging to me? Um, 
I think what's evident in this passage is that Jesus is looking for something in particular in people, and it's not righteousness or goodness, um, but it's uh, a neediness, a need of Him. Um, so that's encouraging to me, as I often see how um, I'm not very needy. Um, or sorry, I, I often see how I, I see my unrighteousness. The challenge is I'm not very needy. I, my, the encouragement is that I, I often see my unrighteousness, and I, and I feel like a failure. I feel a lot of shame. Um, and Jesus looks at me and says, hey, my goal is for you to know you're needy so that you can find your wholeness in me. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and then the challenge. Um, hey, Emily, I see your question. Let me finish what I'm saying, and then I'll answer it at the end. Um, i got to look at my passage, too, to understand what you're asking. Um, the challenge, let's see. Um, I think a lot of times I do uh, find myself acting like the Pharisees and feeling pretty good about myself based on... It's funny, at the same time I feel a lot of shame for the things I don't do right, but at the same time I also try to feel pride for the things I do do right. And I said do-do. <laughs> um, and... Jesus is saying, um, neither of those are a good approach. Um, Andrew, be needy. And so my, the challenge I think this passage is giving to me is to be needy. Um, those are just some of my thoughts. Not super well developed, but that's not the goal of this. The goal is just for you guys to be reading it and coming up with your own thoughts and trying to apply it to your lives. I would love to hear um, some of you guys... Um, your thoughts um, in the comments. Um, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to put out down everything you thought about. But if there's something you uh, you noticed, maybe that I didn't catch, or something that was particularly meaningful to you, I'd love to hear about it. Or put it in. Uh, send it a text to me or into our one of our group chats. Um, Emily, let me look at. Uh, let me look at this passage. <coughs> Let's see what you're referring to. Um, I think you're talking about verse uh, 28, um, 27 and 28. It says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Uh, there's a lot going on in those, those two lines right there, and um, they would be hard to understand, I would think, especially if you don't know that Jesus... Um, one of his favorite names that he refers to himself as, and you'll see it in other places in Mark, is he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Um, referring to himself as the Son of Man actually has Old Testament roots. Um, the book of Daniel prophesied that Jesus would come. This is in the Old Testament, written hundreds of years before Jesus came. Um, prophesied that this Son of Man would come and would bring back the kingdom um, that God had always promised would create this kingdom. Um, and so Jesus is talking, referring to himself as the Messiah when he says he's the Son of Man. Um, and the Pharisees would have understood that. Um, what he's saying in this passage particularly um, is he's saying that the Sabbath was not made for man, man was made for this man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. What he's saying is the Sabbath being the, the seventh day, the day that people rest um, and don't work, um, was always meant as a gift to humanity so that they could rest and learn through their rest to trust more deeply in the Lord rather than trusting in their own works or their own ability to earn the things that they need, but trusting in God to provide their needs. And so it was actually a gift given to them, ultimately to point them to their need for the ultimate rest to be accomplished by Jesus, which is what he does when he creates peace between us and God on the cross. Um, so what he's saying is, um, first he's saying, You're, you guys are so focused on obeying the Sabbath as if that makes you righteous, but the whole point of the Sabbath was that it was supposed to remind you that you can't earn anything on your own and that you need Jesus. And so then he's saying, Jesus, I am the Son of Man. He's saying that. And I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the one that the Sabbath is all about. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Jesus is basically saying something really astounding. He's saying he is 
God. Basically, he's saying he's God. And he's saying also that he is the Messiah that was to come. And he is the one who is going to accomplish true rest for his people. Um, I'd love to know if there's any other questions. Feel free to put those up um, as I'm talking. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close us in prayer. And um, any other questions you throw up there, I will answer in the next video. Just a reminder, um, when I pray... Uh, I want prayer to be a relationship, so I'm going to pray the prayer that I would pray. Um, you guys probably need to pray your own prayers. Um, but uh, following these four elements of adoration, praising God, confession, um, meaning I confess my sins before God, thanksgiving, meaning I thank God for what he has done for me, and then supplication means asking God for things. Um, I do that because it's... The, all the elements of relationship. It's not just uh, making God a vending machine and saying, hey, God, give me this. It's also uh, remembering who he is and bringing ourselves before him. Um, so I'm going to close in prayer following these four elements. Um, you can pray with me if you're on the call. Um, or you can uh, think about, look at these elements and pray your own prayer right now. Um, Father God, thank you for... Um, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you care uh, so deeply about sinners, that you would identify yourself with us, that you would become one of us, that you would eat with us, that you would become friends with us, people who are far below your glory and your honor. We thank you, Lord, that um, you don't ask of us some sort of empty religiosity, some empty... Um, practices that don't have any heart behind them, but you offer us yourself that we might love you and know you, um, that we might see your glory, that we might want to, like Levi, get up and leave everything and follow you, not because it's empty, but because we're actually in love with your person, um, your beauty. We thank you, Lord, for that, and um, we adore you for that. Lord, I confess that so often I try to earn my own salvation, so often I, uh, I uh, run away from you instead of following you deeply, following you closely. I don't want to spend time with you even though I know that it's going to be good for me. Um, I pr pr Forgive me, Lord, for making uh, things like reading my Bible uh, empty religion um, that don't mean anything. Um, but instead of noticing and thinking about who you are. Lord, I pray, um, I thank you. I just thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Word um, that reminds us of truth. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us so many good things, even though this is a really difficult time. I thank you, Lord, for um, not leaving us or forsaking us, for always being present with us, even in the hardship. Um, Lord, I, uh, I just want to ask you to be with the people who are particularly hurting through this crisis, whether it be our students who are, who are struggling emotionally with loneliness or, uh, just the hardship of being cooped up down to the people who are just struggling to get food on the table because of this, the people who are deeply worried about the future of their jobs and their financial situation, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would provide, um, not only physically, but that you would provide yourself. Um, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, that's it. Andres, I'm so sorry you keep crashing, but you can go back and watch it from the beginning when you get a chance. Um, and uh, I'll see you all tomorrow, Mark chapter 3.